I begin with, uh, I'm, I'm discussing the history of fear. And I do believe that that's a very important topic on a college campus. And that's why I decided to not speak about structural engineering, because I think that uh, there's no more appropriate place uh, to speak about this topic than on a college campus. And uh, my, my intention, it, I, I felt that this topic fits into the, uh, the category of involved. My idea is to uh, evolve your thinking when it comes to this, because the history of beer for most people is not a serious topic. Uh, beer is for leisure, and it is for young people, generally men, associated with sports and student life. And uh, that perception of beer is a case of historical myopia, an inability of many people at the beginning of the 21st century to conceive of a world that is different from their own. Uh, the prevailing presentism makes it difficult for many to comprehend a world where beer was a necessity, and for most of human history, Beer was a necessity. Uh, my topic is called Evolve, Altering Your Perception of Beer. And though I'm in civil engineering, that's the last I'm going to mention of civil engineering for today. Uh, but what I intend to talk about are the historical importance of beer, uh, the nutritional importance of beer in the context of human history, the science and engineering of beer, and uh, the positive health benefits of moderate, and I do underscore moderate, uh, beer consumption. Okay, the, 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 there are different ages in human history. There is the Bronze Age, there's, uh, there's the Iron Age. The Beer Age actually predates uh, both of those substantially. Beer was uh, developed about 6,000 BC uh, at, at the latest. It could be as early as 10,000 BC. It, it, some brilliant Egyptians, and also in Mesopotamia, where 40% of the total cereal crop was used for beer, and beer was also used as currency in Mesopotamia in 6,000 BC. Uh, the importance of fear in the context of civilization is the fact that the discovery of fermentation was a very big discovery because it increased our familiarity with the use of cereal grains. And, and that by itself is, that the cultivation is civilization. And uh, beer and bread, there, are, there is some debate as to which came first, and we'll never really know which came first, but what we can say is that beer and bread happened basically at the same time. And that civilization began because of the use of cereal grains uh, for beer and for bread. Um, and that uh, there is some debate as to which came first, which would cause civilization. I don't think that's the important uh, part of the debate. But that beer was there at the beginning of civilization. And then much later on, the development of the village, when we move into medieval England, the, the, uh, the, the pub is an important part of culture. And that in, in the 14th century, there was one pub for every 12 people in England. And that's despite the fact that 90% of the ale drunk in England was home brewed. But that other 10%, we still needed a pub for every 12 people. And that's where we get it. Uh, historically, beer is not an intoxicating beverage primarily. Historically, beer is food. That's what it is for most of human history. Uh, ethanol, first of all, has nutritional value. Your body can use it. Your body does use it. It has twice the caloric uh, value of carbohydrates. Uh, beer stores longer than bread. Uh, and uh, there, the nutritional value of beer by medieval standards was actually quite good. It's high in B vitamins, minerals, protein, and fiber. That was an important staple part of your diet throughout most of history. Uh, the British sailor's diet, this is the official ration from 17th century uh, England, uh, was mainly a, uh, a small group of uh, fats and proteins supplemented by eight pints of beer. <laughs> that was the ration. And that was the ration for centuries. Um, a 4,500-calorie diet, uh, where 35% of the calories came from beer, 40% of the B vitamins came from beer, and 25% of the protein came from beer. A lot of people don't realize that the protein content of beer is not bad, again, by, by the standards of the day. Uh, in 1650 England, the average family of seven consumed a barrel of ale each week. Now, this was a barrel of small beer. Small beer is not really intended to be very intoxicating at all. It's primarily food. That's the whole idea. Low alcohol that you consume with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That was a staple part of your diet. And if you do the math, and I've done the math, uh, a UK barrel is 36 gallons. So with seven people in a family, that averages six pints per day on average for every man, woman, and child. They had it for breakfast, they had it for lunch, they had it for dinner. And this was the average English family. Uh, just to illustrate, it didn't matter if you're aristocracy or not. Uh, this is a, 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 the official record that the 8 and 10 year old heirs to the, to the Earl of Northumberland consumed two pints of ale with each meal time. Uh, that was for, for breakfast, two pints of ale, for lunch, two pints of ale 
uh, two pints of ale for, uh, for dinner. 17th century England, uh, even infants drank small beer. Uh, scarcely ever drank water, although naturally there was no explanation for why this was the case. It was universally recognized that it was safer to drink beer. The boiling and hopping was inadvertently water purification techniques. So there's my there's my connection to my previous speaker uh, that, 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 that is that uh, up until uh, knowledge of germ theory in the 1860s, we did not have an understanding of why water was bad. We just knew that water was bad, and most water was bad. We didn't know why. It wasn't until the 1860s that we knew why and had germ theory. Uh, so it was universally recognized that it was safe to drink beer, and that's what we did. Um, the uh, settling of the, uh, the American colonies, uh, the uh, colonial settlers were sickened by the lack of uh, ale because they were forced to drink water. And uh, they lamented that the English folk were healthy on their strong ale, whereas here there was only water to drink. <laughs> uh, historically, beer is what families drink. It's responsible. It's mealtime. It's not an intoxicating beverage. The uh, lithograph from 1750 illustrates that Beer Street is healthy and industrious and cultured. Uh, it is bountiful. It is friendly. The contrast was with, with spirits. Gin Lane, this was also by the, by the same artist, 1750. This was where it was unhealthy, debauched. And there was, particularly in the 18th and 19th century, a strong push on the part of governments to encourage beer drinking because beer drinking was this image. It was healthy. It had nutritional value. It was good for you. It was mealtime. This is what we wanted to avoid. And actually, our founding fathers, George Washington, was a, was a, was a brewer himself. Uh, advocated a national brewery for these reasons, that this is what we want to encourage. And now at that period of time, uh, 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 whiskey was very popular because you could ship it very cheaply, but, but this was the, the, uh, the image of reality of spirits relative to beer at that time. Um, so now I shift into uh, beer as real science. Uh, food science. Now, not at Lafayette, but at ma many major universities, food science is an important academic department, very multidisciplinary, applied science in uh, food chemistry, food engineering, food packaging, food microbiology. Fascinating science, by the way. And the earliest example of food science is brewing science, beer. Um, beer is one of the earliest examples. It became very scientific very early in human history. Before we had thermometers, we knew how important temperature was in brewing, as I'll illustrate. Uh, and outside of the U.S., if you tell someone that you're majoring in brewing science, that's taken very seriously. Only in the U.S. do we snicker at that. And it's rather rare. There's only a few brewing science departments in the United States. But in most of continental Europe, that's a serious topic. There are serious academic journals on the subject, because why wouldn't there be? If there's food science, why wouldn't there be brewing science journals? And there are. Uh, that is beer science. And I'll tell you briefly about how I, I could go at length at how fascinating a scientific topic brewing is, uh, but I'll just illustrate the basic process. Uh, it's fairly simple. Starch is converted into sugar. Uh, sugar is converted uh, via yeast into alcohol. And some brilliant Egyptian discovered roughly 8,000 years ago that uh, you can convert starch into sugar by using uh, what seeds are supposed to do in the first place. They germinate. So you start a seed, barley usually, or wheat, and uh, you encourage it to grow by, by wetting, and it grows. Now when it grows, enzymes are released that naturally are supposed to uh, develop in the seed that enable that seed to produce the sugar that would enable it to grow. So now that starch is able to be converted into sugar. It otherwise would not be. Uh, it's a, the release of enzymes that enables this. This is a brilliant Egyptian from 8,000 years ago who inadvertently must have gotten something wet and realized that if you subsequently dry that, and then mash it. Mashing doesn't mean hit it with a hammer. Mashing means to uh, put it into hot water and subject it to uh, some very specific temperatures to activate and deactivate. This is where the biochemistry becomes very interesting, is that even though we didn't know the biochemistry thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago, we realized that there were enzymes that were turned off and turned on at specific temperatures. And so that's what the brewing process became. This is uh, food processing. This is how we're using uh, food chemistry to process uh, starch into sugar, eventually into alcohol. Uh, how scientific can it be? Well, there are four major enzyme groups that are, are activated during the mashing process. And even though we didn't have thermometers 500 years ago, the Germans have developed a very sophisticated technique of, of using their body temperature, the boiling temperature, a few other temperatures, 
to know exactly what the temperature of the mash was, because they hadn't invented a thermometer yet, but they knew that some enzymes were turned on at 142 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and then they were turned off, denatured at 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you turn them off, and how long they're on and off affects the sugar profile, the protein profile, ultimately the taste, the mouthfeel, all those things that are, by the way, that's the language of food science. How to use the chemistry to result in a particular feel and taste uh, in the beverage. The Germans were very well adapted to this 500 years ago, even though they didn't have thermometers. Uh, so early science, and then we move on to yeast, which the, we didn't know what yeast really, really was and what it was doing in fermentation until the 1860s, because we didn't know what, what we didn't know the role of microorganisms in disease, we didn't know the role of microorganisms in fermentation. So the English just called it God is good, because they didn't know what it was, but they knew that God was good. <laughs> because that white stuff had to be transferred. When you transferred it to the next brew, it was good. Uh, but at the same time that people like Pasteur and Hansen were studying uh, early microbiology, uh, this is the, period, the, the very same period of time in which we have germ theory. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a microorganism that is, uh, it can, now be, can be associated with infectious diseases, which, by the way, is a huge breakthrough in human history from the context of clean water, uh, medicine. How could we possibly... Uh, uh, have modern science without germ theory. If those same people, those same researchers, were being funded by the breweries, you know, Pasteur was working for Carls, uh, Carlsberg Brewery, and uh, uh, discovered that yeast was responsible for fermentation. Uh, and, and brewing made a very important contribution to science at that period of time. And another note, in, in another direction, beer and nutrition. This is the kind of wholesome image uh, of beer uh, throughout most of history. This is the mid-20th century. And uh, it is marketed that it's good for you. And the fact is that in moderation, it sure is good for you. Uh, and this was, these were the wholesome images. These are World War II images showing that beer is good for you. Beer is best. This was an English ad campaign from World War II, showing that beer is, is what you ought to be drinking, as opposed to gin. Uh, uh, to, to, to illustrate beer and nutrition, uh, Arthur Glatzke, a head of cardiology in 1991, uh, it says that the case is not quite strong for persons at risk of coronary heart disease. There is an optimal amount, not a safe amount, an optimal amount of alcohol to be consumed. And that optimal amount is not zero. Um, and, and for the skeptics in the group, I, I have to, I have to be, be careful about the skeptics. You know, right here is all causes of death, risk. So normalized to one. Uh, zero drinks per day is not nearly as healthy as one drink per day, for all causes of death. And I mean all causes of death. So we're not just talking about coronary heart disease, which, by the way, coronary heart disease continues to be aided by this trend, uh, even at relatively high levels of alcohol. I, 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 I hesitate to put that up there. Now, all of a sudden, I'm encouraging. That. And so, to be fair, uh, I'll, I'll put, I'm not going to put up the other 124 papers that have been written on this subject. But the, 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 the trends you see again and again and again are that for all causes of death, one drink per day appears to be the optimal point where you have substantial lowering of your risk of, uh, of death. And principally because of its positive uh, effect on coronary heart disease. Um, knowing the Journal of Medicine, this is, a, this is interesting. I put it up there just because of the fact that we begin in this article by highlighting all the things that happen from, from the abuse of alcohol. Uh, and, or for, for, for chronic abuse of alcohol, that a person who's a, a chronic drinker of alcohol does have higher risk of uh, death, injuries, violence, suicide, poisoning, cirrhosis, certain cancers, uh, etc. That's, that's all true. You do. But despite that, this is from that paper, Thun et al. 1997, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, for all causes of death, you actually see the, the same minimum point, the deaths per 100,000 in men, that that minimum is at one drink per day. Cardiovascular diseases continue to, to show some benefit with increasing uh, per day. But of course, what tends to happen is all alcohol augmented conditions, principally cancers, uh, start to, be, to go up as we move for two, three, four, five, six uh, drinks per day. Uh, and so uh, because of the cardiovascular effect, that's a, that's a benefit. Uh, because of cancers and some other things, violence, accidents, uh, and there, there's this uh, offsetting trend. Uh, we see the same thing in women. Um, there's still a minimum point at about one drink per day. 
Uh, and that's interesting is because of the fact that for, for women, one particular cancer that is, to be truthful, uh, always uh, adversely affected by alcohol is breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer is, uh, all the research appears to show that uh, drinking is never good for breast cancer at any level. To be, to be truthful, those are the facts. But uh, more women actually die from cardiovascular disease than they, they die from breast cancer. And consequently, we still have this one drink per day as an optimal point. Um, uh, roughly 124 papers have been written on this subject. And so the summary at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center uh, is that the review shows that uh, there are positive health benefits of moderate beer consumption. They match those previously reported for red wine, but people don't believe it with beer. They don't believe it. There's no reason that they should be different, because principally it's the ethanol. Um, uh, it's also due to the fact that beer contains similar amounts of antioxidant uh, oxidant materials that are found in red wine, and four to five times as much time found in white wine. Now, you don't believe it with, with red wine, because you look at the red wine drinker and you say to yourself, well, that, 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 that's, that seems like a healthy thing to do. The image of beer is inconsistent with the idea that, uh, that it should be, should be good for you. But the fact is that Guinness contains uh, uh, more antioxidants than Wines. You're, you're darker, your darker beers are very high in antioxidants, and they are, in fact, good for you at, at modest levels. Uh, other effects, and there are many, many effects. We can talk diabetes. Diabetes is an interesting one, I'll just bring that up, is that uh, low levels of drinking actually reduces, to some extent, your risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. At high levels, the opposite is true. You know, the, the theme becomes again and again and again. Moderation is good. Excessive drinking is never good. This is interesting because uh, this paper is in the England Journal of Medicine. It's the adverse effects of, uh, of alcohol on cognitive function. And it, it begins by saying that if you, if you decide, as a, as a lifestyle, to drink excessively for your entire life, uh, there's going to be an adverse effect on your cognitive function later in life. Okay, so that, that would be a very good reason to not drink excessively. This paper is on moderate alcohol consumption. And the conclusion is that moderate consumption may decrease the risk of cognitive decline in older people. Uh, and why? Well, beer, as I did say, contains nu nutrition. Uh, it, is, it does contain very significant quantities of B vitamins compared to other foods. Uh, it's pretty competitive against cereals, beets, uh, and vegetables. Uh, it does contain minerals. In some cases, it has better mineral benefit than a, than a lot of the, the others in, in that list. It actually contains fiber, and that fiber is soluble fiber, and there's significant clinical evidence that soluble fiber can also be a cardio benefit, particularly if the beer you happen to be drinking is unfiltered and cloudy, because it does contain more soluble fiber. I can show also my graph of my blood over a two-year period when I switched to uh, uh, unfiltered beer, and my, my uh, cholesterol declined significantly with no other lifestyles. That's a double jump. But let's, uh, <laughs> let's stick to the point, which is that it, it, it also contains protein and antioxidants that uh, are of a, a benefit. Uh, chronic excessive use, let's just make sure the point is crystal clear. Chronic excessive use will lead to neurological problems, cardiovascular problems, psychiatric problems, social problems, cancer of the mouth, liver diseases, and other problems. But the facts, let's stick to the facts. And, and I'll, I'll, I guess a little bit of opinion, if it hasn't already come through, will come through now. Uh, the facts are that moderate drinking is, uh, the benefits outweigh the detriments. And it is, it's undeniable. There's just too much research to support the fact that moderate drinking is good for you. At the same time, there's too much research uh, to, to suggest anything other than heavy drinking, the detriments outweigh the benefits. But one thing that I find odd, the facts versus the laws, is that one of the reasons you haven't heard about, perhaps, the positive health benefits of beer and wine, and spirits, by the way, uh, is that it's, it's against uh, federal and, and state laws in the U.S. for any company, like Robert Mondavi tried to, and Anheuser Bush tried to, uh, publicize the fact that it's a positive benefit when it's consumed moderately. Uh, and that's this feeling that, that, that um, you can't advertise the health benefits. You're not allowed to do that. In fact, there's been a, a push by some to actually put nutritional information on beer and wine. And Mondavi actually tried doing it. Yeah, at the time, uh, ATFs uh, had to remove those labels immediately. You can't claim those benefits. Uh, and it's, it's odd to me because it's, a, it's, it's kind of supposing that we're not bright enough as a, as a, as a culture, as a, that the people aren't bright enough to discern that. It's a simple message. Moderation is good. Excess is bad. We can say some other things, too. 
For example, if you are at substantial risk for cardiovascular disease because maybe of your genetics or maybe some other aspects of your lifestyle, the facts would be that drinking a little more would actually be a benefit. But we're not allowed to say that. But to be fair, if you have a risk of cancers, the right number is probably zero you know, in many cases. I, I, I just think that that kind of information ought to be a little bit more clear. I think it ought to be okay for uh, you to advertise the positive benefits also, let everyone remind everyone of what the detriment is in excess. And uh, in my, my summary, that beer is historically important. It's, it was considered a staple food for most of history. It is serious food science, and moderate consumption is beneficial. And that's, that's my message. I hope that I've evolved your thinking just a little bit on, uh, on beer. Yeah.